I'm going to explain why I think poor tea is really the most complex tea and the tea that you will end up falling into if you're a, a committed tea enthusiast. You see, most teas are made from a dedicated cultivar. For example, if I tell you Longjing, Tie Guan Yin, Tie Luo Han, Sui Xian, Zou Gui, Ya Se Xiang, Milan Xiang, these teas, they, they are named after their cultivars. And um, the cultivar really makes the taste. Now the cultivar in most cases is a clone, so all the tea trees have the same genetics. That's really what can give you a very specific taste which you can easily identify. If you look also at the leaves of different teas, it will be very easy, for example, to, to recognize a, a Longjing or a Taiping Hokue, or at least you can see if it's a rock tea or if it's a Dan Song, these things. There's a huge diversity in terms of leaves. When it comes to poor tea, it's much harder to see the differences between the leaves. You can tell a few things, mostly about the processing, but I will be hard put on saying where the tea comes from by looking at the leaves. So at a first glance, you could think that poor tea all look like the same and taste like the same, but it's not true. And you'll find this out by tasting multiple poor teas. Poor tea does not use clonal varietals. So in the poor tea making tea gardens, each tea tree has its own genetic pool. Now the farmers who grow poor tea have a semi-nomadic tradition. In the past, maybe a hundred years ago, they would set up a temporary village in a place, do slash and burn agriculture, stay for maybe five to ten years, and when all the land around had been used up for agriculture, they would move somewhere else. When they started the tea cultivation, they will carry the seeds along with them. Now you can imagine that if you stayed in a low area, you have your seeds, and it's a pretty hot climate, and then you move higher up in the mountain and you plant those seeds at higher altitude. Now comes the winter, and this one is particularly cold, and you have several episodes of frost over the winter. What's going to happen? A lot of your tea trees are going to die from the frost because they were not acclimated. Let's say 90% of your tea trees die. The remaining 10%, they survive because they had a natural resistance to frost, and now you've made a new varietal out of the gene pool that you brought to that higher altitude place, only 10% survived and you're going to use the seeds to extend your tea gardens and the genetic profile will be different from your original varietal. And this is really what happened in each of the famous tea mountains in Yunnan. I read a paper regarding the genetic diversity and they tested the genetic profile of different ancient tea gardens in Yunnan and they found out that there was a significant difference between each mountain. So the first factor that makes poor tea very interesting in terms of taste is the diversity in varietal. That diversity is not as obvious as for other kinds of teas, but you will see differences across different areas. Now the second factor that makes poor interesting is the diversity in microclimate in each area. Yunnan is a mountainous region and it means there are lots of microclimates and that diversity in microclimate and soil conditions might be an even more important factor than the genetic diversity. Even in a given village you can have widely different growing conditions depending on the altitude, the slope gradient, some soils that might change, for example usually the lower slopes will have more clay while the higher slopes will be more sandy and that will influence on the nutrient and water retention capacity of the soil and also the, the texture and structure of the soil. So that diversity in geographical features also adds complexity to the taste of tea. Now you have to look at the garden design. And when it comes to garden design, there's a lot of diversity in Yunnan. In Mongku, all the ancient tea gardens I've seen were growing on open fields. They don't have shade trees, they don't grow in a forest like we have in Jingmai. If you go to Monghai area, you'll also find some ancient tea gardens in the forest and some others growing in open field. And that will definitely influence the physiology of the tea, the speed of growth and what kind of uh, nutrients they accumulate, what kind of pest attacks them. And that will create that diversity of taste. 
And finally, we have the difference in processing techniques. For example, in Iwu, in eastern Sichuanbana, people will tend to give a lighter shaqing than in Monghai, in the western part of Sichuanbana. But of course, you could argue that that diversity is present in other kinds of teas. So that doesn't really support the argument of poor tea being a more fascinating teas than others. I really encourage you to study the processing of different teas because that's really one aspect in which you can dig in and that's a true rabbit hole and you'll get a lot of enjoyment for, from this. All these aspects that I mentioned, the varietal, the growing conditions, geographical features, microclimate, altitude, garden design, and the processing habits, the traditions, they make what we call the terroir. The terroir is a French word that comes from the wine industry, and the terroir is a combination of these four factors. So you could say that each area is a terroir, and there are different scales to a terroir. You can think of the, the Monghai terroir, which is quite a vast area, and in Monghai you'll have about a dozen famous mountains which constitute uh, another terroir, you could say a sub-terroir that is attached to the Monghai terroir. And then you could go down to the village in each mountain, you'll maybe have five to ten villages, and you can study the diversity between the villages. And then you can even go down to the garden, that's what we do in Jingmai. Every year we process tea from different tea gardens from Jingmai village and try to study their diversity. And when you're a tea enthusiast, what you want to study is the terroir. You want to understand that concept because this is really the most fascinating topic in the tea world. Drinking poor tea is really the most rewarding because that's the family of tea in which that terroir idea is the most prevalent. And that's why so many experienced tea drinkers end up drinking almost exclusively poor tea. Personally, poor tea makes about 80% of my diet and I drink the 20% remaining of other teas to maybe stimulate my curiosity, remain open-minded and have some fun with different tastes. But really poor tea is the kind of tea that I feel I will be studying for my whole life just to understand that concept of terroir, which is a wonderful part of our universe. Thanks for watching and have a good tea.